All right, so last week we covered the history of Leica. This week we're going to look at the camera bodies that I have here. I've got an M9 and I've got an M10. And the shaking that you hear is actually from the little clip that's holding my diopter in there. So nothing to do with the camera. So don't get freaked out about that. But it should be this way actually, M9, M10. But uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the history and the, uh, you know, history is in, this is a, almost a 12 year old camera now. Uh, even though this is a only three or four year old camera, it will be uh, very soon. Um, talk about the features and uh, you know why I went with the M9 and, and now the M10 um, to go with that just to give you a little taste of, of uh, what they are. And of course, just like modesty photography, saving you money. Yes, these are expensive, but I bought them used, both of them. You know, I don't like to buy brand new anything because uh, uh, you know, um, I like to save money as much as I, as much as I can, even though with these, you would probably say, oh my God, you call that saving money? One million dollars. But if you compare them to brand new, yes, I saved quite a bit of money. So anyway, um, stay tuned and let's get into the, uh, get into the details about these babies. So M and M, stay tuned. Here I am, here. This is Camera Talk with Dr. Scott, or since we're doing uh, my series on Leica, uh, this is part two of Leica Man in Vietnam. It's got a nice ring to it, I think. So in our first episode uh, last week, what, uh, what we talked about is kind of an overview of, of Leica and, you know, going through the history and, and the, the run up to uh, the digital uh, M systems that uh, that Leica currently has um, in the market, and you know what led us up to uh, up to uh, current day, and um, you know specifically, uh, you know I'm focusing on the two uh, cameras this week that um, that I personally own. Uh, you know I can't talk about the uh, SL2s or the Qs. Um, or the CLs or you know any of the other uh, models because I don't have any I don't have any experience with them so I'm just going to focus on the uh, the two M's that I have I have an M9 I have an M10 and together that makes M&M the M&M's man the M&M's man and he has a lot of love to make it all taste good who dunks M&M's this is terrible no not that M&M &M. Uh, no, not that M&M &M either. We're talking about M as in for German, uh, it, you know, the M stands for Messzucker, which uh, translated means rangefinder or combination of viewfinder or rangefinder together. Um, so to start us off, I want to talk about the M9. Um, and then I'll lead up to my, to its big brother, the M10. So the M9, uh, as I mentioned in the first video, uh, the M9 is a, is a uh, digital rangefinder. Um, it was, you know, again, a, a groundbreaker for being the first uh, of a few things. It was, it was launched 9-9-2009, uh, so t September 9th, 2009 uh, in New York City. And, uh, you know, what made it different from the M8 and the M8.2 was the fact that it's a full frame, a full frame digital uh, mirrorless rangefinder, the first, the first of its kind. So that's, uh, that's kind of its claim to fame, really, um, to start off with anyway. And, um, you know, some of the specs on it, it's an 18, 18 megapixel uh, sensor, a CCD sensor, as opposed to, you know, what other manufacturers out there were using a CMOS. Uh, actually, jump ahead on sneak preview, which is where my M10 uh, is using a CMOS. But the M9 used a uh, CCD um, sensor. And there's, you know, talk out there between, you know, users of the M9 and whatnot who feel that the, you know, the 
the, the photos and, and what they get out of the M9 uh, as far as colors and, and resolution and contrast and everything else goes beats out the CMOS sensors. So that's, you know, what the talk is all about. There's arguments that go back and forth on that. And uh, I'm not going to judge either way because I have both and I, you know, love them both equally, kind of like my children. Um, but the other thing that, uh, you know, it's uh, um, been known to have is the fact that its, it's sensor is great for, you know, capturing the light transmission across the entire sensor. Uh, so from corner to corner, side to side, it, uh, it catches that, it catches the light. So, um, so that's, you know, the technical aspect of it. Um, one of the downsides, you know, of this CCD sensor was uh, made by Kodak. Um, through their manufacturing processes, somehow it was overlooked that there were certain layers or elements of the sensor that were not coated properly. And what this led to through humidity and other aspects uh, of the environment uh, led to digital rot, which basically boils down to having spots or donuts or circles, whatever you want to call them, blemishes on the, uh, on the sensor. You know, it was it was a problem for a lot of uh, a lot of the cameras that were initially produced and put out there, and uh, but because people loved the experience of the camera, they loved the uh, the output, you know, the the types of of photos they were getting from this camera. Um, they didn't want to just toss it out and go with something else, so you know they they pleaded with Leica to do something about it, and Leica responded. And from, you know, the first point where they were discovered uh, all the way through to 2017, they replaced them for free. This particular one here was replaced um, in 2000, 2015. Got a new sensor uh, installed in it. And uh, it's worked perfectly ever since. And from 2017 through 2020, August 2020, they would replace, you know, other ones all up to that point for $1,600, you know, because they figured if, if, you know, they were give, giving these things away for free all the way up, up till uh, 2017, it kind of covered their warranty, so to speak. But uh, so they started charging $1,600 to change the, uh, the CCD from there. But after th 2020, that stopped. So if anybody now has a, has a uh, M9, it has a digital rot problem of their CCD sensor. They have to go to a third party, um, to which they are out there. I couldn't tell you who they are off the top of my head because I don't use them, but I know they're out there. Uh, so that it's an option for anybody with an M9 that has that sensor problem. But anyway, um, so that's the CCD and that's, you know, it is what it is. But again, what, um, what leads to a lot of people feeling quite attached to their M9, um, you know, is the same with, with most um, Leica uh, M products, is the, the experience, the feeling, you know, of, uh, you know, the weight of the camera, the feeling of it in your hand, whatnot, is, uh, you know, um, it brings a, brings a feeling of familiarity, like you remember an old friend so to speak. And I know that sounds like a lot of BS to people, um, especially people who don't have one. So uh, it's hard to explain that to the people who don't experience it. But for those of you who have a Leica and know what I'm talking about, then you know what I'm talking about, uh -huh, so to speak. But it's a, you know, it's a great piece of engineering. You know, it's an, uh, it's a, it starts off as a piece of uh, magnesium alloy, gets molded, uh, shaped, um, you know, at the factory into the uh, the shape that it's in. Gets a brass top, a brass bottom, and uh, and you can feel it when you hold it. You can feel that uh, 
that weight and the uh, you know how solid um, how solid it is. And uh, as I said, it's it's something that um, um, you know that really has to be experienced. It's pretty tough to to sell it to you over over a, a video. You gotta say what you're feeling. But um, anyway, it's you know again it's a manual manual focus manual uh, um, everything really. I mean the only the only features on top are like the shutter dial here. Uh, which you can put on aperture priority or auto because obviously not aperture priority because it's a manual aperture. You know, I have a 50 Sumalux on here now, so I can 1.4, 2, 2.8, um, you know, whatever I'm going to set it at, set my, um, you know, set my uh, shutter dial to whatever I want. And then on the back here with the, uh, with the M9, ISO has its own button. Uh, you set the ISO that way. Now, um, that's one of the complaints, you know, people have. But, you know, remember, this is from 2009. This thing's already, um, already 12 years old, or will be 12 years old this year anyway, uh, which is pretty old for a digital camera. We're so old! So, you know, the screen is outdated, the buttons are outdated, all these kinds of things. But the experience again of of owning a Leica M9, um, you know, kind of outweigh the fact that it's kind of outdated, so to speak. So um, things like ISO, you know, have a range from 160 to uh, 2500, you know, is the range, which isn't very big at all. And even still, the usability of uh, of that ISO range is pretty much tapped out at, at 1250. A lot of people will set their uh, set their ISO between 160 and 10,000, just so they don't go over that. But 1250 is still eh, borderline, borderline usable. Um, some people may have arguments for going higher than that, but the consensus is pretty much uh, somewhere 10,000 or, or uh, um, 12, you know, 1250 uh, on that. So, um, and actually, I'd say 10,000. I meant. Uh, uh, 1,000 on that. Um, actually, let me check something out here. Do, do, do. Let me look through it real quick. So I set my slowest speed at uh, 160th of a second, just to give you the range that, uh, that I set this at. Uh, 160th of a second, and the maximum I set it at is uh, 1250. And it says not 10,000, obviously, if the, if the max is 2,500, <laughs> so 1,000. Uh, yeah, I get a little carried away with, uh, with numbers at times. But anyway, um, you know, it, it has, you know, one of the differences between the two. Um, up top, we have off, we have a single shot, we have continuous, and then we have a timer that you can set through your on-off button versus the... Uh, M10, which just is turn on, and then you do your continuous or uh, self timer through the through the menu itself. Um, so it's very simplistic. It's very simple. Um, the range, the range finder, um, you know, lines for those who who understand how range finders work. You know, basically the uh, two windows here, the uh, the range window and the viewfinder um, have to both see the object that you're focusing in, in on, and as you turn the, uh, the focus ring, the two, uh, the two work together to match, um, match horizontal lines on, uh, on the subject itself. And when they match up, you know you're in focus. Um, so that's how, you know, that's how range, range finders work in that regards as far as focus goes. Um, but this little window here uh, lights up the frame lines, and the difference between again a, uh, a range finder and a, a um, another um, model like my A7R R2 uh, Sony product, you know, you're looking through the lens. So when you see through the range finder or through the uh, viewfinder, what you see through the lens is exactly what's in the photo. In a range finder, you see more than what's actually in the photo. So you have to look at little frame lines 
uh, and I'll show you this and it's right here. And so you can see the two different frame lines. One is a uh, 75 millimeter and the, uh, the outer line is a 50 milliliter millimeter and the, uh, the smaller square in the center um, is the 75 millimeter frame line. So you know that's where your photo is going to, to be. So you choose your composition accordingly uh, in that regard. And then the little rectangle in the uh, center is actually your focus, uh, your focus area. Uh, so it's very simplistic, you know. Um, you know, it's an easy camera. Well, I wouldn't say it's easy. <laughs> it takes practice, obviously, to uh, to use this. But um, but as I stated, using something like a rangefinder is very much like uh, like using uh, anything from the past. You know, uh, you know, any kind of vintage, whether it's a vintage car, a vintage watch, you know, vintage. Vintage whiskey, you know, they uh, all these things have their appeal, you know, people like what they like uh, because they like them. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. If you want to put it in a simplistic term, um, and you know, you don't have to if you know if you are like a user, you don't have to justify why you use Leica. You just like it. It just that's your preference. And I know there's a lot of photographers out there who beat up on Leica uh, users for, you know, wasting money or, you know, the camera's not as good as their camera and so forth and so on. And all these things may be true. Sure, they are a waste of money. Uh, but so is buying, uh, buying a Porsche 911. So is buying a Rolex. You know, so is buying, you know, that uh, uh, the villa on, the, uh, on that little tropical island somewhere that you only go to once every couple of years. You know, all that stuff could be considered a waste of money. But as long as it makes the user happy, that's what it boils down to. So that's why it doesn't matter how many camera snobs out there tell me I'm wrong with this or I'm wrong with that or I don't know what I'm talking about and blah, 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 blah. Who cares? You know, really, it's, it comes down to what do you like? What's important to you? So anyway, so this was the M9. Um, so let me jump over now to the, uh, to the M10 and talk about that. So... Hang on, just a sec when I switch cameras. Alright, so that was the M9. Let's move on to the, uh, the M10. And, uh, you know, again, totally different, totally different from the M9. Um, and I'll go through all those differences now. The M10 is kind of the M9's big brother, you know, uh, skipping over the uh, the M240, 240, and uh, 262 type, uh, kind of like the Porsche and their type 911, type you know 928, so on and so forth. Uh, the M10 was re released uh, January 19th, uh, 2017. And it was much anticipated. I mean, there, there was a lot of people who were complaining about the, you know, the 240 and, and whatnot about the video and saying, you know, Leica's, uh, Leica's M system shouldn't be tagged in with video. It's pretty much a stills uh, camera and a stills uh, history. So, uh, so they went back to basics. They, they got rid of the video and... Um, you know, they put a new, um, a new sensor in there, and even though it's a 24 megapixel uh, sensor, CMOS sensor, which the 240 also had, but it's still a new sensor. It's different from from the the 240 and obviously the 262. Um, so it's a brand new, brand new um, 24 megapixel uh, sensor. Well, isn't that? Special. And uh, you know a few other things are bigger. The uh, uh, the viewfinder, thirty percent bigger, uh, which is nice. You know it's it's you know I can notice it'll be bigger than the uh, than the uh, the M9. Uh, magnification increased from point uh, uh, six eight times to point seven three times. You know which is again great. You can see you know a little further uh, out there. Um, 
They added 50% eye relief for those who, who wear glasses or who eyes, their eyes, you know, tire easily, uh, whatnot. And generally those are for people with, uh, with eyeglasses. As you can see, you know, in the M9, remember there was a window here for illuminating the uh, frame lines. Well, that's gone also. Um, uh, so now it's LED lit. Uh, so you can see, see those frame lines. You know, see with the power off, if I look up, I don't see anything versus on the, on the M9 here, even with no power, when I look through the range finder, viewfinder, um, I can still see the, see the frame lines um, in that regard. So uh, next thing is it's a smaller body. You know, it's a little smaller than the, than the M9, but it's a lot smaller than the, uh, the 240 um, and, the, and the 262. So uh, it's more like the original M uh, film cameras when you look at the, the width of the body. You know, it's within, within millimeters anyway, which is really nothing when it comes to, comes to size. That's what she said. So, it's, uh, so it is a little smaller uh, feel in the hands. It's got the same construction though, magnesium alloy body, body with brass top, brass bottom. Uh, so it's got some heft and weight to it. One of the things that they've added besides the, uh, the same uh, shutter dial that the M9 had and the release up here, remember I told you already they got rid of the uh, you know, single continuous and timer. That's now in the uh, menu, so now it's just a simple on off. But besides that, they've also added a dedicated ISO button over here, which again kind of gives it that film feel because this is, would be the rewind. Uh, you know, on the on a film camera, so the um, ISO dial, you know, to introduce it since it's new, um, ranges from 100 and goes up to 6400, and there's a manual and an auto uh, feature on here too. For M, M is set in the menu, and what most users do is they set their M at their at their maximum ISO. Um, to which is, you know, again, the range, the range is, um, you know, 100 all the way up to 50,000, which remember the M9 only went up to 2,500. So 50,000 is a huge leap from nine to 10. Um, but again, 50,000 is a little extreme. I don't know anybody who actually uses it. I've never heard of anybody using that. So the realistic, uh, range, uh, goes up to either 10, 10 K or, uh, 12,500. And so when you, to use it, you have to, um, pull up on the, uh, on the, uh, the button itself and, and turn it, turn it from there. Um, some, some cameras, I guess the new brand new ones, again, this is used. I buy my stuff used, uh, all the time. So mine is, uh, not that hard to, not that hard to lift up. Um, so my M my M is set at, uh, at 10,000. And so when I set it at 10,000, that's the max that it's going to, uh, that it's going to shoot at using, uh, using that ISO feature. Um, but I generally leave it on auto. What I suggest everybody uses, uh, and I have a separate video on that is a, is a white balance card. Um, you know, so when you're, shooting whatever scene you put that white balance card in front of your subject in the lighting that you're going to be shooting in take that picture set your white balance to uh to match the uh you know the light uh fallout on that on that card and you'll have much more accurate uh color renditions in your in your uh, photos but if you're just out there shooting you know randomly in street stuff and whatnot like put it on auto um and again, you can set your, set your low, set your high. So you have a range, uh, in there, uh, same with the shutter button, you know, uh, most of the time we leave it on auto. Some people call it aperture priority, but there is no aperture priority on a manual uh, camera. So I don't know why, why they call it that your aperture priority is actually on the lens itself. So I have a 35, uh, millimeter, uh, Sumilux, uh, FLE, uh, one of the best lenses that uh, Leica has ever made. It's a super excellent. Yes, it's Superman. Excellent lens. We'll talk about that in my next, my next video. But right now we're just talking about the bodies. 
So, um, you know, again, another, another feature uh, different than the other cameras is they have an extra button here on the front, uh, which you press in and it gives you, um, you know, gives you different features such as using exposure uh, or magnification, depends on how you set it up in your menu. Uh, so you press that and then press the wheel on the back and it, uh, and it, and it you know, provides a different function than if you press the wheel by itself. You know, so you can have multiple, multiple functions uh, using this type of button here. Uh, speaking of the back, again, we have three buttons, you know, simplification. On my um, uh, M9, we had five buttons. On here so uh, you know we simplified it again down to three buttons it's a larger screen uh, than the M9 had and the glass itself is a gorilla glass so it's scratch resistant uh, in that regard too there's rubber um, rubber coating um, you can take off the uh, the bottom plate here um, rubber sealed all the way around so that it's weather resistant definitely not weatherproof it's not like you can jump into the ocean with this thing and go underwater and take photos or anything uh, you, you might be able to but don't tell anybody I told you that because uh, you can't blame me for taking your like underwater but you definitely shouldn't do that um, you know again it's it's weather resistant it's not weatherproof and even if the camera survived it the uh, the lenses themselves are not weatherproof at all um, so you're definitely going to get water or dust or anything inside your, inside your lenses if you take them out into such conditions as that. But still, it's nice to have weather resistance anyway uh, out there, so you can get, you know, you can get rained on and whatnot, and not uh, not suffer um, some terrible consequences. Uh, what else can I tell you with some updates on here? Um, uh, live view. There we go. Live view is the top button. Live view, uh, what it offers you is a couple different features in that regard. Once you turn live view on, what it does now is it, it, it looks through the lens, just like your regular SLR. Um, so you can actually look through the lens. You can focus with it, focus peaking. You can magnify to get a close up on it. Or um, for those who, you know, can't afford uh, Leica lenses, but they still have a Leica body uh, that you buy. You can adapt, you know, really anything these days. They make adapters for every kind of lens. So my uh, lens, vintage lens collection here, you know, I have 80 some odd lenses, uh, you know, Canons and Konica's and Takamars and and Carl Zeiss's and uh, uh, Olympus's and, and Jupiter's and you know, you name it, uh, I've got them up here. I've got all the best, uh, the best of the best um, vintage lenses. And I can adapt all those onto my, uh, onto my M10 and use live view to be able to focus. Because as a rangefinder, you know, a few like the Jupiters and whatnot are, are rangefinder lenses. And a couple of the lenses, a couple of the Canon, um, Older lenses, you know, use uh, like amounts and whatnot. So those are rangefinder, but most lenses aren't. Most lenses are designed for SLR cameras. So through a, the use of an adapter, you can actually put this on your M10 and use it. You know, because I have, you know, I have a, a nice little collection of Leica lenses. Um, I've actually not even done that. I've had no no need to because these are the best lenses in the world that go with match up made perfectly to go along with uh, an M camera. So why mess with the best? You're, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, but the options out there and it's the same going the other way. I could take my, uh, which I've done, you know, taking my 35 millimeter here and used it on my Canon or my Canon, my Sony a7R2. And it works, you know, works great through with, with the use of an adapter, but it's designed for an M system uh, so therefore it's it just goes hand in hand with the name and works best with that. So anyway um, What else the processor? It's a maestro 2 processor uh, Which is which is you know piggybacked from the uh, SL uh, Cameras that are out there the the uh, SLR version that Leica has of their uh, mirrorless um, 
you know, full body uh, cameras. So the Micro 2 is great. It, it, what it does is it takes my Canon M, or my Canon, I keep saying Canon. Got Canon on the mind. Uh, my Leica uh, M9, which was two frames per second, and now it brings up to five frames per second, which again, if you're gonna compare it to my Sony's and, and whatnot, is not that fast. But for our, the Leica M, that's plenty fast enough, you know, five frames, frames per second uh, really does it. It's got a smaller battery than the M9. Uh, it's another complaint uh, that users have is the fact that it's a smaller battery and they're not cheap. But, you know, again, if you're going to be shooting all day with, these, with this camera, you should have a couple of batteries uh, to back yourself up with. Um, they also charge fairly quickly too, so um, it shouldn't be that bad. But anyway, it's all about the experience. It's all about, uh, you know, the fact that when you hold one of these, uh, one of these cameras in your hand, you know, it gives you that sense of connecting with, a, you know, the history of the 35 millimeter camera. You know, fact, my team. Um, you know, it gives you a, a feeling of, uh, of happiness, really. As I said, when I, when I drive around in my, in uh, my 1983 uh, SL, uh, convertible Mercedes. I have, I have that feeling of, of, uh, you know, freedom, you know, as wind blowing through my hair, you know, even though my, my hair, I keep it quite short these days. I cut it every couple weeks. So, you know, it's not exactly like I have flowing hair, but still, um, you know, driving that car, uh, is is an experience, you know, and because it's a vintage and because it's a cool car I get people all the time at a red light always roll down their window and they say hey cool car What year is that? You know it looks fantastic and so on and so forth all the new stuff that everybody has the fancy schmancy bells and whistles and whatnot Nobody really compliments those kind of cars because everybody's got one. They all look the same your Lexus looks like a Mercedes looks like a BMW You know looks like everybody looks the same so um but these don't look like anything uh, that's really out there. I guess Fuji's make something similar, you know, in this footprint. But um, but still, and there's like a, like I keep saying, you know, as far as photography goes, it's a tool. You know, there's a lot better cameras out there that do many more things, especially with autofocus. You know, hey, my A7R2 kicks butt on this thing when it comes to, you know, what it can actually do. But for the experience, though, uh, this kicks butt on the a7r2 you know again this gives you the feeling of taking a photograph you know of being part of that photograph being uh you know being the uh you know the conductor of the uh of the result and again when it comes to experience you can't put a price tag on that as i said many people will say oh my god you wasted all that money and so forth and so on but it's my money if I want to spend it on that, that's my choice, right? Uh, there's nobody out there to say what you should and shouldn't do with your with your money. Everybody tries to. Um, there's a lot of people who are out there who are envious or jealous. They wish they had one of these, or people who have had them and then go back to DSLRs and then miss the experience of this, so they end up coming back again, uh, revisiting the uh, the world of Leica. Um, but unless you've never been there and you've got no experience with it. You really shouldn't have much of an opinion uh, on it besides wishful thinking um, and whatnot. But anyway, as I said, it's an experience. It's not the greatest camera in the world, uh, but it does its job. It does what a rangefinder does. It gives you that experience. It gives you some great pictures once you actually take uh, a good picture. Um, you know, there's many pictures that you miss focus or you, you know, you've, you know, you've got the wrong settings and, and they don't come out well. But hey, you live and learn. And, you know, it's all, it's all part of a journey and, uh, really getting to the end of that journey is, is what it's all about. So anyway, that's my take on, uh, my M9 and my M10 and, um, yeah, again, it's my choice. It's, uh, it's what I've chosen as my, my favorite, uh, my favorite camera system, um, when it comes to you know, efficiencies and speed and, and, you know, resolutions and megapixels and all that other stuff. My Sony a7R2 does the job for me. 
and I can, you know, even even with that system, I only have my uh, my Zeiss uh, 55 and my Zeiss 35 um, FE lenses that that Sony uh, made for Sony, uh, and those are it for actual native lenses. The rest are my vintage lenses that I adapt to my Sony and I use them all the time. And I have more fun with those, again, because it's like driving a stick shift versus, versus automatic. You know, it's like having a, an auto wine, like my, like my Omega Seamaster, you know, and this is a really old watch. But it's, you know, it's, it's auto, it's from my moving my wrist around, that winds it, there are, there's no battery in here or anything. Um, but again, it's for people who appreciate those things, they appreciate fine craftsmanship and and uh, the effort that goes into producing such a thing. Um, so it's not for everybody. It may not be for you, but um, but it's for me, and it's for a lot of other Leica users out there. So again, just wanted to introduce you to the the bodies that I have, the M9, the M10. Uh, Leica makes many other things, uh, but I don't know anything about them, so my God, I'm not going to talk about them at all. So this is what I've got to say about that. Uh, so stay tuned for next week uh, when we get to the lenses. I'm going to get into uh, the lenses because that's kind of where really where the uh, the biggest difference is made. You know, a camera body is a camera body, but this lens uh, could last you a lifetime and you can adapt it to many other bodies. If it's on an M, it adapts already. I mean, from my, as I stated in my very first video, you know, from my, uh, my Sumar in 1933, to the uh, Sumatar in, in 39, to my uh, Sumacron in 54, you know, to my um, Emirate, 28 Emirate um, in uh, 1979, um, you know, up to, up to my modern lenses. You know, I'll talk about those next week. But for now, uh, that's all I've got for you. So that's Camera Talk with Dr. Scott. That's like a man in Vietnam. So uh, stay tuned next week and we'll get uh, into more of this, uh, this topic of Leica. So um, as usual, uh, give me a subscription. So subscribe, switch hands, subscribe, and together, subscribe. Give me a thumbs up for the thumbs up girls, of course. You know, for those who are into uh, into editing their software, which you should be, um, even though you know, for like even myself, uh, time is sometimes not that available to me because I have a eight and a half month old baby, so he takes a lot of my time. Being a university teacher takes a lot of my time, so a lot of times I just take shots, photos straight out of my camera, JPEGs or whatever, and post them to. Facebook or Instagram or whatever. But when I do have the time, I like to edit my photos and I do so with uh, Luminar. Uh, Luminar and Luminar AI are a couple of great products. I have a link below if you want to save $10 on it because it's already a pretty economical program uh, and it's yours for life once you buy it. Uh, there is no monthly fee or yearly fee or anything else. You own it, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, but if you want to save 10 bucks, which is why not say 10 bucks? There's a link below. It, you know, kicks a little back to me if, uh, if you click on that link. So, hey, why not help out a, help out a teacher? And uh, other than that, I'll see you next week at Camera Talk. And remember, this is Modesty Photography. And as much as we're talking about Leica and Modesty Photography, don't exactly go together since these are, uh, these are out of the price range of many people. Um, it's still. Uh, have yourself a great week. Stay safe. Stay away from that COVID, and uh, and I'll see you in the next episode. All right, bye bye. Here I am, Vietnam. Green is all we need.